Hello and welcome to another edition of EVE Geography and Geopolitics. I am Alexei Avkar, joining you once again. I apologize for the lack of updates on this series. Uh, I had plans, and I'll just be honest with everybody, they kind of got away from me. And uh, real life being what it is, hasn't made things easier. This is a COVID lockdown edition of EVE Geography and Geopolitics, but we do have a lot to talk about with this 2020 Year From Hell update. <laughs> on the EVE universe. First off, we're going to start with the geography. Now, if you've seen my other videos, and I highly recommend going back and re-watching the original, this map should look familiar to you. Now, there haven't been a massive amount of changes. However, there have been some interesting developments, particularly in this central area of high and low sec. Specifically, this year EVE has launched the Triglavian Invasion storyline which has involved the abyssal space Triglavians coming into known space and causing trouble for the established empires of the game. These empires are now banding together in, uh, with Edencom. It's a new NPC faction of sorts with a new line of ships. Very exciting stuff. And uh, there's kind of an ongoing event. Now, it is not clear how long this event will be for, but it does continue to escalate, at least at the time of this recording, which is in late June. And it's had some interesting consequences for EVE's geography. Now, uh, before we get into those, I'll explain a little bit about the event itself. It's basically a tug-of-war between NPCs, where players can join one side or the other and compete to complete sites, NPC sites. And these sites will... Uh, will determine which slide, how far the slider goes in either direction, whether you've decided to support the Triglavians or support the Empires via Edencom. Uh, they do have slightly different rewards. Edencom gives you some LP, Triglavians more ISK. And, uh, you know, there's various groups organizing on both sides. Now, the Edencom guys are basically fighting for the status quo. However, the Triglavians winning has some consequences. Signer jammers and unique NPC structures will appear, and uh, they'll start to do some interesting things to the sons of these particular systems. So we've got these awesome pictures of what happens when a Triglavian system begins to get, uh, get deep into what they're calling the liminality. That's even further. And here you can see them uh, mid-harvest. There's a lot of speculation about what's going on in this picture. Uh, it could be that they're changing the star into a different type of star. They could be harvesting some of the Isogen 5. That is a... I think it's Isogen 5. That's the uh, building material for the Triglavians. Also, this black structure kind of reminds me a little bit of a Dyson Sphere, so that could potentially be something as well. Now, it doesn't just affect the star. This process will actually lower the security rating of the system to the point where you can turn high sec into low sec, or what is essentially null sec. We have some Empire systems, previously high-sec systems, which are now full negative 1.0 true-sec, which is insane. Now, it hasn't come with all of the null-sec strings. However, one thing that has happened is that these systems have gone from Concord-protected to not Concord-protected, uh, which has resulted in a pretty awesome bloodbath. Now, we have to talk about the specific systems themselves, so we're going to concentrate on the areas of Domain, the Forge, Lone Trek, and this area called Essence, which is Galenti Space. Uh, the first system to go was called Raravas, that was in Domain, and the others have fallen subsequently, and there are a few more currently being contested as of this recording. Now here you can see the Raravas system with ships and pod kills in the past 24 hours. Shout out to Wallari and Dotland. He's a fantastic dude. Ooh, we're getting a little refresh. Awesome. <laughs> Wallari, Dotland, Eve Maps. Again, highly recommend evemaps.dotland.net for all of your Eve navigation needs. It is my favorite website. 
and here you can see Raravas, which is officially still listed as a high security system, listed as 0.6, but it is in fact no longer 0.6, it is a combat engageable system. You can go in there and you can shred face. Which is awfully uh, interesting. Now, a lot of the word is out about Raravas now. Uh, when I first got the idea to put this new version of the series together, Raravas was seeing some of the bloodiest fighting in all of New Eden as people went in there at pretty much a meat grinder. A mix of people not realizing it wasn't high sec anymore, to people going in to kill those people, to people going in to kill the people that were looking to kill those people, and random people just looking for immediate fight content. Everything from large fleets to small roaming gangs. It's just kind of a, a meat grinder. A hamburger hill, if you will. <laughs> As you can see, it has calmed down a little bit. Quite a bit, actually. But in the meantime, other systems have since begun to go negative. Also in Domain, we have the system of Harva. Up in the Forge, Sakenta is quite close to Jita, and you can see the number of kills there uh, has even trumped Raravas, which is extremely surprising. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. You've got Arvasaras over here in Lone Trek, also extremely hot, extremely hot. And finally, Vale in essence, not that hot. Now the previous systems that we just named, Vale, Arvaceras, Sekenta, and Harva, you'll all notice that these are dead-end systems. That does not appear to be a deliberate strategy from the Triglavians. As we can see from Raravas, this is a system connected to other systems. Uh, quite close to Yule, quite close to Mai. These are both extremely uh, relevant systems to the EU geography and travel, both Sino and uh, just regular going by gates. Uh, but with that said, I, there could be something around the various groups perhaps putting more effort into defending the non-pipe systems and the Triglavians are taking the wins where they can. There's also some speculation about the types of suns that the Triglavian forces are going after. Uh, certain types of suns seem to have a, a more predominance in what systems are being attacked through this event. If you want to get involved in this, uh, there are quite a few discords and such trying to organize the various forces, and you can hear about them through, uh, you know, you've read it, forum postings, or I highly recommend this channel, Reload, on YouTube. He's got an entire series about the Triglavian invasions, and he's got some tips as to how you can get involved. On one side or the other, of course, he would strongly prefer you join the Triglavian side, as would I, because it's way more interesting to get the uh, EVE map shaken up. <laughs> now, it is interesting that all of these systems being dead ends have had such intense fighting, but I think it's something to do with how new they are, whereas Raravas, the word is kind of out about it. But we will see how this progresses. And like I said, the one massive unknown in this whole situation is whether or not these changes will be permanent or semi-permanent. There is a fair chance that all the progress will be reset at the end of this event. They'll go back to normal. But this is also the chaos era of EVE Online, and there's every chance that these systems could remain nullsec. In fact, have their in-game security status updated to the uh, to whatever level the, the players have it set at as they continue to contest the systems. I think that would be the most interesting thing to do in the game. But uh, we'll see if CCP goes that route. It could potentially revolutionize EVE geography as low sex systems are where Sino fields can be lit and they are essential for cross-regional travel for capital ships and super capital ships. More options means fewer choke points, which means ease of travel for those ships makes them more difficult to hunt. can also open up the options in terms of jump ranges and staging points. Just add a whole new layer of uh, strategic depth to the game. So uh, that's what I'm pulling for. 
would be interested to hear what you guys are pulling for in the comments below. Now with that, we got to hop into NullSec because there have been a lot of changes on the political side of EVE Online. And we start in the north. I want to draw your attention to Veil of the Silent and uh, kind of tribute by extension. These two regions kind of set a certain chain of events in motion. Pandemic Horde and PanFam generally, Northern Coalition, Pandemic Legion, and their associated alliances, had held Tribute and Veil of the Silent as their primary nesting grounds. Test was also there for a time. Test moved south. Pandemic Horde, and a very uh, controversial at the time decision, but I think it's worked out quite well for them, decided to move further east and get into the drone lands over here. This opened up a power vacuum in Vale and Tribute, which was filled by a number of small independent alliances. Normally, when this kind of uh, nullsec arrangement happens, you'll see renter alliances installed, or maybe a smaller ally will be given a larger amount of space to try to get them built up. In this case, Horde just dropped that region, essentially, and let anyone that wanted to come in come in. A number of independent alliances took that opportunity. Um, Shoutouts to Toilet Paper, who was a southern alliance. Um, quite familiar with fighting those guys in Great Wildlands and Scalding Pass. They relocated up to Tribute. Our good friends wrote Capel. Tremendous alliance. Uh, aggressively mid-tier, as they like to market themselves. Uh, long-time frenemies of Noir and uh, some really good dudes that met IRL. Uh, they are now holding the border area of Tribute that used to be held by Mercenary Coalition along with their allies in Spoken Alliance, another uh, former Great Wildlands Area Alliance. Uh, they would consider themselves drone lands. We saw quite a bit of them. And then there are a few other independent alliances, Freight Train, Federated Alliance of Mafias, which is brand new bros, uh, Trigger Happy, Scumlord. You can see all these guys in here. They're fairly independent. Uh, some of them are al allied with each other. For instance, Rokapel, Unspoken, and Federation of Conifers over here are quite close. But in general, it's a fairly loose, independent group of alliances. This rearrangement triggered a lot of things. Um, I believe we talked about it a little bit in a previous video, but there is an increase in tension between Pandemic Legion and particularly Pandemic Horde, and a coalition that's probably in our previous map <laughs> that we looked at in this series called Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, if you're an astute follower of this series, you'll notice those alliances are no longer here. There was a massive eviction war. Uh, it began with PanFam fighting Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, just the, the trust between those groups was never really there. That all stemmed from Guardians of the Galaxy taking a ceasefire from Imperium, kind of leaving board. Not quite out to dry, but you know, certainly isolating them. And the terms for Guardians of the Galaxy were uh, uh, they were fairly embarrassing uh, in some ways. The uh, the cost for peace was very very high, uh, and it was widely regarded that they didn't take that deal. That they were probably going to get rolled over. So they were already operating from a position of weakness. We talked about it a lot in the Declarations of War podcast. And you'll see the declarations of War Euralagus over there somewhere. <laughs> uh, if you want to get caught up on that, we have quite a few episodes where we discuss the politics of that situation. And you can also listen to our backlog where we detail the unfolding of the war play by play. But in terms of the final result, you had Horde and PanFam fighting. Fraternity got involved. They have, and we'll talk about them sort of in a second, but they have steadily made their way north. And this was kind of the last straw on that after having resided in Oasa over here in the drone lands for quite a while. They joined the fight. Uh, Test and Legacy Coalition came north to p apply pressure in Pure Blind. So you had this three front war. You had Pure Blind, you had Declan and Fade, and then you had Branch all being attacked at the same time. And while Guardians of the Galaxy did get some backing from the Imperium, at the end of the day, it was not enough to keep them intact. 
they slowly began losing ground. They lost two or three key staging systems in a row, uh, just continually moving their lines back and back until finally they just couldn't handle it anymore. They had a full political collapse. Their alliances disbanded move or moved to other coalitions or a mix of both. Uh, some key corps spun out into their own alliances, some key corps spun into the Imperium, some key corps spun into Legacy. Uh, they kind of just scattered to the winds. And uh, their coalition leader essentially lost his political power, voted out, basically. Uh, so they are gone, and that left a big gap, and this gap has been filled by Fraternity which is largely using Branch as rental space, as far as, and Fraternity is a Chinese-speaking alliance, getting the internal deliberations is a bit hard. However, the prevailing wisdom, and certainly the way the economic reports are breaking down, still shows Owasa as their primary area of economic activity. It is believed Branch is intended to be a rental development space more than anything else, although it's conceivable as the Alliance continues to grow, they may use more and more of it for their own purposes, as opposed to renting it out to other people. The other big benefit was the United Federation of Conifers, which went from a small pure-blind alliance with a few systems, I think, in Fade as well, to expanding out into Declan, taking most, if not all, of pure-blind, and expanding their holdings in Fade as well. They made out nicely. <laughs> and they've, they've managed to remain relatively politically independent, uh, largely because they're well-liked and PvP very competently. So they are a large, competent, I'd say mid-gang PvP alliance that is, as of right now, not under severe political pressure from any specific coalition, which puts them in a a fairly unique spot, probably close to CVA in terms of EVE's ecosystem, but without all the baggage. And we'll get into CVA in a second. Moving to the east, we want to talk about the drone lands here. This has become Pandemic Legion's primary area. PL, Horde, Northern Coalition Dot, and their various attendant alliances are all here. And you'll notice of the SOV holding groups, Northern Coalition and Pandemic Horde now occupy the vast majority of these systems. Actual Pandemic Legion, relatively few, um, especially given the others, but they still remain a PvP powerhouse. Do not let their footprint on the map confuse you. <laughs> now, as I mentioned, Fraternity is not actually part of PanFam, but they remain very closely aligned. Now, you can see, obviously, they have a lot of Geographic entanglements, they are considered politically independent entities, but they have a lot of strategic interests which are aligned, and in fact, they voted together as blocks in the recent CSM election. So there is a suggestion of long-term cooperation there, but I wouldn't quite call them a super coalition yet. <clears throat> <coughs> now, you'll notice that a lot of the alliances here uh, used to be what we would consider like the wormhole type alliances. You had Skill Yourself, you had Hard Knocks Associates. They are all gone. Skill You has completely disbanded. And Hard Knocks has effectively abandoned their renting empire. I don't believe they have much, if any, of that left. Uh, Hard Knocks Associates still exists, but isn't really what it used to be in terms of the EVE map. Fraternity had rotated into this position from their space further down south, which we can start to scroll down to. And you can see that Legion of X Death has basically filled the gap of where Fraternity used to be, with a few exceptions, which we'll get into in one second. But uh, Fraternity has just generally rotated up. They've just gone up and up and up and up and up. <laughs> and now they're a, a bi regional alliance doing quite well for themselves. They are producing inhuman amounts of ISK, let's say, in their regions, particularly Oasa, and uh, where they were living before was much the same situation. 
But it is what it is. Uh, they can do that quite safely in the drone lands because there's no NPC space to really hit them from. It's very difficult to stage an invasion or stage capital ships into the drone lands from low second empire. It's very far, awkward jump routes. Uh, so if you wanted to have an area where you could super grind for ISK and just multi-box work walls to your heart's content, it is a very, very appealing area to do that, as long as your alliance can handle the logistical challenges, which an alliance like that size almost certainly can. And in fact, they've done quite well for themselves. Now, if we look down here in the south, I mentioned that there is one exception. And while Legion of X-Death has absorbed a lot of the areas that Frat used to be in, along with another, a number of their partner alliances in their coalition called Fire Co., you'll notice a new player on the board, the Army of Mango. These guys are a very important alliance to keep an eye on. They are a number of extremely experienced Chinese players, which have moved from the Chinese server onto Tranquility, and... While their skill points might be low, their game experience is very high, and I think it speaks very highly of them that they've managed to take some of these deep nullsec regions and really thrive there uh, while still being a relatively young alliance. I, I don't even know if they're over a year at this point. It might be. They might be close either on either side of it, but a, a relatively new alliance compared to a lot of the groups on this map. Now, they were kind of taken in by Legacy Coalition, which is Test, Brave, Evictus, these, these groups in here, essentially Siberian, I believe, has joined them as well. And they are considered members of the Legacy Coalition. Uh, you can look at them strategically and consider them as uh, effectively brought in as a counterbalance to Fraternity. They were traditionally Fraternity's rivals on the Chinese server. And it can be interpreted, uh, they may deny it, but effectively Legacy has brought them in as sort of a potential counterweight to Fraternity. Call it a long-term strategic bet that these guys will be able to compete with them in that time zone, given the time to develop them. And Legacy is giving that time, giving that support, and I imagine it will pay off for them fairly well down the line as these guys increase their skill points, increase their ISK caps. And, uh, I mean, Almst in particular, it's such a deep region. It's very difficult to, uh, to stage any kind of, like, attack against them. They're quite secure down there. Their NPCing should be quite secure down there. They already have the combat experience from the Chinese server. They were one of the top-tier groups of alliances over there. So they know what they're doing. They're, uh, should be very, very effective. And, uh... We'll see that play out in the next couple of years. Now, really quickly, I want to get into some of the small stuff. Uh, just a few cool shout-outs. This doesn't have anything to do with the grand game of EVE. But you'll notice Valkyrie Alliance, Bright Side of Death. i got to give shout-outs to these guys. They were former Great Wildlands groups. And we fought with them when I had created the Capitalist Army. Valkyrie is essentially an amalgamation of a bunch of those alliances that we were friends with and fought in the wars down there. And they have come in and taken quite a bit of Scalding Pass, doing very well for themselves, essentially completely independently. I believe there's some light support from, uh, from Legacy Coalition, but not really. And then Bright Side of Death, uh, just one of the coolest Russian alliances I've ever encountered. Um, major love to those guys. They're very effective at what they do. <laughs> very effective at what they do. And they are now taking a little bit of saw for themselves as well. Um, spoils of them outlasting TP and other groups in Curse. I managed to getting a little, a little tiny dot on the map, so i got to give shout-outs to those guys. And finally, moving into Pravi Block... Uh, you'll notice that the CVA still standing tall, but if you look super closely, you'll see a lot of different uh, different colored dots there. Some of that is incursion by Wrecking Coalition. Excuse me, Wrecking Crew Coalition. A Wrecking Crew is full disclosure the coalition that Noir is a part of, which is my corporation. 
We have been uh, mostly on deployment this year, fighting pretty extensively in the west of EVE. We've actually been up here uh, in Cloud Ring, Pure Blind, Fade. This has been our area of operations effectively since January, February. We've been up there a lot, effectively uh, helping to harass Initiative and Imperium reinforcements up to Guardians of the Galaxy and other groups in this area. Basically, anytime these guys want to fight, they're going up through a bunch of jump bridges to get to the front lines. Our job has been for the past few months to harass and disrupt those bridges. It's been super interesting. We've taken a bunch of other contracts as well, but that's been kind of our recurring theme. We've been going back there for like these month-long gigs. That's been uh, been quite fun. Quite an interesting challenge for us, forced us to adapt and learn and grow quite a bit. But we always come back to Providence. That's where the heart is. And Wrecking Crew has made progress in Providence. Slowly and steadily gained a number of systems and advantages and other systems that they haven't quite taken yet. Uh, major shout-outs to the Rogue Consortium, which is a tremendous alliance, part of Wrecking Crew. They've made a lot of the gains, as well as Purple Helmet of Warriors which is a much larger alliance. Uh, they're kind of like the core Wrecking Crew alliance. I still like TRC, though. I got uh, a lot of respect for those guys. There are a number of alliances in there. I don't have time to shout out everybody. But those are the primary land holders. And they're continuing to make gains. And very surprisingly, <laughs> Noir's hostile Freeport and the legendary system of 9UI, which is the beating heart traffic hub of Providence is still alive. It's been like two years. And uh, that baby's still kicking. The market is in fact thriving. Uh, it's doing pretty well for itself. So uh, if you are out there and you want to roam into Providence, you want a little piece of the action, whether it's to fight the organized fleets of Wrecking Crew or fight the legendary defense fleets of CVA, or simply to roam around and pick off the numerous, numerous soft targets that live in Providence, uh, whether it's PvEers or newer PvPers or just old bad PvPers, <laughs> uh, you can dock up at 9UI at our Citadel. You can sell your loot there. You can buy new ships there. You can buy new equipment there. Uh, other developments include Tickle, which is the Australian-based alliance that actually helped us set that Citadel up this Freeport Fortazar that's holding a market in the middle of CVA Sovereignty. They've actually joined Wrecking Crew now. We're starting to work more closely with them. Really great to have those guys in the fold. There's also some evidence of some fractures in CVA. A lot of the newer alliances and new blood are kind of bucking up against the old guard, which I mean, CVA is infamous for being set in their ways. <laughs> so... You know, there's a, a lot of challenges for them. I think Wrecking Crew is a st is committed to prolonging this conflict as much as possible because it's really fun. So even though Providence is having its challenges and being forced to confront some of its uh, maybe outdated approaches to certain things, whether that's organization or strategy or doctrines or culture, uh, they're being pressured by Wrecking Coalition, but gradually. Uh, I don't think either side really wants this fight to end. Well, I'm sure CVA does at this point, uh, but Wrecking Crew definitely doesn't. <laughs> uh, and at this point, before we get into the final stretch of our segment here, which is going to focus on the future of EVE and where the big geographic shifts are going to happen, I want to give a plug for my own corporation, Noir. We are a mercenary group. We're based in Providence, but we go all over the place. Uh, we go into wormhole space, we go into high sec, we go into null sec, we go into NPC null sec, hostile null sec, low sec, you name it, we fight there. We go where the money is. We are uh, full-time mercenaries, one of the very few alliances in EVE that still does that. And we do it full-time. Now we're always looking for great players. And at this point, we're also looking for good corporations. We have an alliance called the Network. We have a training corporation called Noir Academy. So we are open for recruitment for just about anyone that wants a taste of the EVE mercenary lifestyle. It's a very unique play style. I've been doing it for most of my EVE career. I took a 
two or three year break from it when I was putting Capitalist Army together. And as much fun as Capitalist Army was, I really wouldn't trade the Eve Merc life for anything. So if you are still listening at this point in the video, I would encourage you to give it a try. If you're a newer player or an older player that hasn't done much PvP, Noir Academy is the place for you. If you've got a background in PvP, whether that's great stats or some FC experience or both, you know, consider joining Noir directly. And if you're a corporation of players that wants to make the jump, please convo a Lexave card in-game, send me an email, join our Discord. would love to talk to you and kind of explore those options because the network is, for the first time since I've created it, looking for an additional corporation or corporations to join Noir in our mercenary endeavors. So if that speaks to you, come speak to me. Now finally, we're going to go into the Deep South. We're talking Legacy, and we're talking the Imperium, which is Goon Swarm all the way up to Initiative. Now these alliances may only hold, what is that, two, three and a half regions, maybe four regions tops. Do not let their space on the map fool you. They are the economic juggernaut of EVE. And they have considerable, considerable military might. They can essentially field two full fleets of super capitals and have the organizational capacity to operate them independently on two sides of the map. They've shown that they can do it. They are a tremendous, tremendous feat of organization and logistics. And very recently, their two groups, which are comparably sized, culturally somewhat similar, Imperium, far more structured. Test Alliance, far more popular, I would say. Uh, their coalitions have ended a long-standing non-aggression pact. At the time that we're recording this, it is widely believed that both sides are building up for an inevitable conflict between the two. It is unclear which side is going to take the first shot. It is unclear where those shots are going to be taken. However, Imperium has taken the steps of effectively removing themselves from Cloud Ring, which is this area up here. Initiative has been spotted pulling up Keep Stars, pulling up Fortazars. They're moving troops out. They had staged briefly up here to try to cover that retreat, but I believe they're even now pulling back from that. So they're, they're turtling quite a bit. What that can mean? A little unclear. There's two ways to interpret it. One is Imperium just has a long history of strategic withdrawals and kind of cropping and containing their uh, what would otherwise be a sprawling empire to make sure they have borders they can actually defend. It could be that they're anticipating not just getting hit from the Legacy Coalition, but also potentially one or more of the other coalitions hitting them at the same time in which case having a smaller area to defend would be an extreme advantage. Could be a combination of both those things, could be just some careful planning. Not quite clear. But I will say this, in terms of the geographic aspect of this fight, there's a couple ways combat between coalitions that have held these two distinct areas of space can play out. Just the nature and history of EVE, it's, it's kind of worked out this way. You see these long jumps in between these regions. That means that, uh, for instance, Paragon Soul and Period Basis, impossible to Sino to directly. So you cannot actually launch a capital invasion between the regions. Likewise, Stain into Period Basis. Likewise, uh, Catch, and I think that's Quirious. It's just too far. You have to go into these midpoints. The effect of that is Delve down here and period basis is sort of an extension of it and Quirious is sort of an extension of that have often operated as a cohesive political unit. Sometimes that extends up into Fountain, sometimes it doesn't. It kind of gets traded in and out. <laughs> Meanwhile, Paragon Soul, Faith of Bolas, Omst, you know, these areas have tended to coalition together. Usually either directly with or with a loose affiliation from the group that owns Ketch. Because Ketch and Stain are basically the lifeblood for these deeper Nullsec areas. You really can't get much logistic support from Empire without going through that space. 
Uh, you can like take some long ways around it, but it can get very dangerous. So, it's just traditionally kind of broken down that way. And so the way these conflicts will usually play out in a few ways. If the Paragon Soul group, or Catch Paragon Soul groups, are the aggressors, you will typically see this area become a hot spot. And ironically, you'll not often see this area become a hot spot. That's not doesn't mean that's how this is going to play out. In fact, I would like to point out that Goonsworn, since I would consider them to have the distinct advantage in logistics for this war, I think the deeper in Nullsec this war takes place, the greater advantage the Imperium will have in winning it, simply because they will be able to out-hustle, out-freight, out essentially, replacement ships, staging, staging stations, that kind of thing, than Legacy Coalition. Legacy is a great alliance, but Imperium has their logistics and economic wing so well oiled, it's absolutely their organizational strength. So the further that the active fighting takes place from convenient logistics from low sec and high sec, this benefits the Imperium. They effectively has a, have a closed economy where their ISK generation and resource generation, it's almost all consumed in-house or saved. Very little of it makes its way back to Empire, which means they have a lot of stockpiles, a lot of money, a lot of minerals, a lot of ships, and a lot of practice not relying on any other region for their resources. Now obviously there are only some things you can get from Empire Space just not available, and they are also practiced at getting that stuff in. So I think they are they're well positioned there, now, it's important to note that United Earth Directorate, these groups up in here, they're not really directly affiliated with the Imperium. You can think of them as buffer states, which means that while it is possible the fighting will attack, will go through here, I'm not certain it will be as likely as it would otherwise be in, in previous conflicts where Quirius was more directly owned by a pet or partner alliance of the coalition that held Delvin period basis. These guys are obviously not hated, because Goonswarm could just roll them out anytime they want, but they're not really tightly involved in the Imperium. The other way this can play out is staging from low sec or NPC null sec. So you could see, well, you could see the attacker's base in Stain. Sometimes that happens, but it largely has depended on whether the Coalition owners were Russians or not. The Stain Russians are an infamously persistent group in EVE Online, and they have typically owned Ketch and other surrounding regions as well. In those cases, Stain has proven a pretty effective jumping off point as well. I'm not certain it will be as pivotal in this particular conflict, but it certainly could be. There are NPC stations here, there are uh, midpoint systems that can be used pretty effectively if people wanted to, but it just doesn't seem likely. The Paragon Soul period, uh, per, excuse me, Paragon Soul and Catch related alliances could stage in the NPC systems in Delve, are I believe here. That has a, a distinct advantage in that you can't really be pushed out of them, you can basically attack Delve as much as you want. The downside is the owners of Delve know that strategy really, really well, and it's never really proven that effective at driving out a stable Delve period basis coalition. It has been effective at capitalizing a coalition that's in collapse or otherwise has some kind of outside stressor going on, but for a coalition as established as Imperium is, particularly Goonswarm in those areas. It certainly seems on paper like a great move, but historically not super effective. Could go the other way. So you could have Delve here go into Cannon, for instance, and stage into Ketch from there, attacking the Ketch entry point. That is also extremely possible. That has sometimes worked. Now it can be a bit of a pain I think especially for a group like Imperium, again talking about their logistics, much of their logistics is going to be oriented around the null sec of Delvin period basis, and to a lesser extent Fountain. They've already got their stores set up. Realistically, they would have to move it all. So unless they perceive a 
particular weakness here, I doubt the full invasion will come from there. Uh, it's entirely possible they'll have a SIG, which is a special interest group, uh, go there. In fact, both groups will probably have SIGs going back and forth, hunting and harassing each other. But I think of the main fighting for this, we will probably see it occur in period basis in Paragon Soul, at least initially, with a secondary chance of delve from the NPC stations, with Legacy attempting to stage there. That's my early prediction at this stage. There's really no way of knowing how it's all going to play out until things actually get started, if they even get started. It's a fair bit of speculation as to whether or not this fight is even going to happen. But if it does, it could potentially be one of the most interesting and pivotal fights between coalitions that Eve has ever seen. Uh, Legacy and Goonstorm are really two of the titan coalitions in the game right now in terms of size, and certainly Goonstorm in terms of wealth. The fact that they've been next to each other for so long and haven't really exchanged blows in a meaningful way, it just lends itself this narrative of, well, how cool would it be if they did? <laughs> And we may get to see that. So, depending on how that goes, depending on the interest on this video, depending on how, uh, how real life goes, whether we're all still here in a year, uh, I may do another update on this to let you guys know how it's gone. Maybe we'll get some update about this Empire system stuff. Maybe those null sec, excuse me, low sec systems will go permanent low sec. Maybe it'll go permanent null sec. I'm just all for less Empire in the game, so I hope for either one of those options. And I also hope for Noir to get involved and in all of the interesting conflicts to come. And I hope that you out there, if you're interested in the EVE Mercenary Life, consider joining us. And with that, I am going to sign out. This is Alexei of Card. You can follow my Twitch at the bottom, twitch.tv slash Alec. You can follow my podcast up at the top, declarationsofwar.com. You can consider joining my alliance, the network. We're more than happy to talk to corporations interested in giving full-time EVE Mercenary PvP a try. So wherever you are, whoever you're flying with, and whatever area of space you call home, good hunting, everybody.